It's an honor to address this distinguished audience today. And it is humbling because the issue of human rights in Kashmir is so important for the lives and future of so many people because it is essential for the very principles of human rights. In two days, on 10 December, it's 70 years ago that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the United Nations. In 28 days, on 5 January 2019, it will be 70 years since the UN General Assembly adopted the resolution calling for the future of the state of Jammu and Kashmir to be determined by a democratic and impartial plebiscite. While the former has thrived and become a point of reference across the world, against which all human beings can measure their living conditions and strive or battle for betterment, the latter has suffered a failed existence. Yet these two are closely intertwined. The success of the former depends also upon the implementation of the second. Human rights were not set up as an exclusive privilege, but are to apply to all human beings, also in occupied territories, also in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Now, finally, after all these years, the UN has produced the first ever report on the human rights abuses in Kashmir. It's horrific reading, painful. Yet, paradoxically, it's a report we must welcome, not despite, but because of the horrors it depicts. Because for years, those gruesome acts, those horrific mass rapes, torture, kidnappings, killings, have taken place with little to no attention paid by the outside world. Documenting the violation of human rights may seem a small, but it is a very significant first step to halting the abuse. In conflict zones, human rights are always under pressure, but where an administration is and freely can operate as an occupying power rather than as a government to its people, living condition and human rights situation for the citizens turn particularly precarious. There evidently will be no democratic and civil rights, no basic freedoms. Accountability fails, justice fails. At worst, everyday life turns dangerous, insufferable. When you wake up, it's anyone's guess if you'll be alive at night. It is such a worst case scenario that is a very real life situation for the people living in, or rather trying to survive in, Indian administered Jammu and Kashmir, which I'll focus on here today. Their plight cannot continue. The situation has to change. And hopefully this conference, arranged by Pakistan House, and together with all of you present here, can help further the road for change. Let me give but a few examples, some were given already by the previous speaker and others you know, but when women are raped with impunity by so-called security forces that should protect them, when inexplicable kidnappings and forced disappearances are rampant, when parents can't send their children to school and be certain to see them again in the evening, there's nothing we can call human rights in place. When there are laws such as the Armed Forces Special Powers Act from 1990, and the Kashmir Public Safety Act of 1978, creating structures that makes it impossible to hold the powers accountable for violations of law and human rights, even when it comes to torture, rape, and murder. Evidently, there are no speck of human rights. When a government turns pellet firing shotguns on its people, it does not represent but repress them. In Indian Minister Jammu and Kashmir, between July 2016 and August 2017, 17 people were killed, but 6,221 were injured by metal pellets, fully or partly blinding many of them. These are the official figures. It's anyone's guess what the real ones may be. We are talking about young people losing their eyesight by arms fired by the security forces. When a local civilian man is tied to a car and used as human shield for <coughs> occupying forces, as was the case of the 26-year-old Farouk Ahmed Dar in April, in April 2017 on polling day in Srinagar, Bukha, there are no human rights. When there are attacks on medical services, when ambulances are destroyed by the security forces, when tear gas is fired near or inside hospital, there are no human rights. When journalists and human rights defenders can't act and write freely, when they're detained, like the Kashmiri photojournalist Karan Yusuf or French journalist Paul Committee, or like the human rights defender Kumar Pawes, there are no human rights. When in a few years, 
Hundreds of thousands of civilian people are detained for political reasons, and many of them die in police custody. And when 75% of prisoners are subjected to torture, there are no human rights. When children are detained, there are no human rights. When schools and colleges are closed for nearly 60% of the time, as was the case for the school year 2016-17, there are no human rights. When the administration continuously restricts or even suspends mobile and internet services so that the population can't garner their complaints or just communicate with each other or the world, as was recently the case for about half a year for seven million people in Kashmir, there are no human rights. When one part of the population has less rights than other people under the same so-called government, there are no human rights. It would be ideal if Jammu and Kashmir were demilitarized and if the plebiscite could finally be held so that the populations can decide how they wish to be governed. But the world isn't ideal. And realistically, even second best political solution, even noting the commendable latest generous gesture of opening the Katapur corridor for Sikh pilgrims by the Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan, would probably be a while to come. But this is exactly why the one minimal thing that must be done immediately is to find a way to secure the basic human rights of every man, woman, and child living in Kashmir. It's not controversial, or at least it shouldn't be. There can be no two sides to human rights. I'm sure that no government, certainly not the Pakistani, but not the Indian government, will deny the very principles of human rights. It is the implementation of these in Kashmir that must be demanded. Saying it is simple, but of course I know that there is no simple in getting it about. To start with, there are many good recommendations in the UN report, and much more can be done. Hopefully, all the imminent forces gathered here today can come together, not just spreading the message, but also finding the way. To secure urgently the basic human rights for the citizens of Jammu and Kashmir <coughs> nations, it's all of us all citizens of the world. So it's up to all of us, particularly all those of us from other and safer parts of the world, all with power and influence, Mr. and Mrs. Ambassadors and representatives of the international community, to impress on our government to call upon the United Nations to deliver on its promises, decisions, and principles. When human rights are violated in Kashmir, they are violated in the world. That's why we must care. All across the world, we are one world, one humanity. The brutality that happens against one person is the brutality against the humanity of all people. Not just because the abuse of power that happens in one place today can set a precedence and will easily spill over elsewhere tomorrow, but because we are each other's keeper. That's what the Declaration of Human Rights is about. We cannot not care. We don't have the right not to care. We cannot look the other way while the country celebrated as the largest democracy in the world acts so undemocratically, so inhumanly in its occupied territories in Kashmir. The human rights, as they are laid out in the Universal Declaration, is our basic measurement for living conditions everywhere. That is why it's so ominous, yes, even disastrous, when not some American or European, and also Danish, my own government, nationalistic politicians question the Human Rights Declaration. It is so gratuitous to do so in countries of democracy and prosperity, when being part of a homogenous majority, when living in safety, when being able to send your children to school in the morning and know you'll see them again safe and sound later at dinner. Because for all the people in the world who don't have this privilege, for all such as the Kashmiri mothers and fathers who don't know if they'll see their children again, who live under laws that don't protect them, under a government that are not their friend but their adversary, they have nothing to hope for other than exactly the principle laid out in the Human Rights Declaration. The hope that people with safer life from safer nations will compel their governments to stand up, not just for their own human rights, but also for the rights of others. And to never forget, but to find ways to also secure the human rights of the horrendously oppressed and abused people of Jammu and Kashmir. So today, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Mr. President, let's do exactly that. Thank you. Thank you.